Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, just for the record, Mr. Goff asked me to notify the court that he has some business to attend to. I'm not sure what that is. But he, uh, since he's not involved in this motion, um, he had to step out. Of the <coughs> Kill the messenger. I was just say, <laughs>
the time it would take me to do that, I have a feeling I could do what I need to do to get back. And I thought I would much rather hear it from you than as opposed to just hearing it secondhand from someone who's just sending a message to take them over there and you don't hear it. Yes, sir. I understand what's going on. I just want to make sure everybody's clear in mind. Thank you. I let the bailiff know Connie Scroggs. G-G-S. Miss Scroggs, where do you live generally? In Athens. Do you own properties elsewhere that you rent out? Yes, I do. In um, where? What sort of places do you own properties that are rented out? In um, Brunswick and St. Simons. And in Brunswick, do you have any properties in the Satilla Shores area? Yes, I do. Do you know Greg and Lee McMichael? I do. How do you know them? They have been renting from us for about seven years. Tell us about what sort of renters they are. Excellent tenants. Always paid on time. Um, they've never been late. Greg always managed to uh, take care of the small repairs and uh, he wouldn't even call us, except for the large ones. We had a, a roof that had to be replaced, but the small repairs, Greg always took care of. So in the trust, the confidence that you've developed with them over the last seven years to care for your home and to make their payments on time, have you been able to develop an opinion about whether you think Greg McMichael would be of any danger to people or other people's property if he were released on bond? No. Have you formed an opinion? Do you think whether think whether Greg McMichael would be a danger to flee and would not come back to trial when it was time for his trial if the judge were to release him on bond? No. Now, do you feel very strongly about that opinion? Very much so. Have you offered to put up some security to stand behind that opinion? We've uh, put up our house, you the house that he lives in. You would be willing to put up that house? Yes. And can you tell the court the value, the unencumbered value of that property? The, um, the county record had it at 244. Is there a mortgage on it? No. And you're willing to sign your name and say, I'm going to let a lien be put on this property. And I understand that if Greg McMichael does not come back to trial, I could lose this property. Absolutely. Why do you feel so confident that he'll be back to court? I guess it's just knowing the type of person he is, the type of family they are. I have no more questions. Ms. Scroggs, briefly, my name is Jesse Evans, I'm the prosecutor on the case, and uh, I just want to ask you a little bit of background. Y you've known the McMichaels then for seven years, it sounds like, through this tenant-renter uh, relationship, correct? Yes. Okay. 
And um, were you back then at the beginning of this rental agreement? Were you living in Athens then? Yeah. Okay. And and what about on February 23rd of 2020? Were you a resident of Athens at the time of the shooting in this particular case? Yes. Okay. Uh, you're aware that uh, during the time of that last period of time that uh, the McMichaels were renting the home, both Greg and Travis McMichaels were living in your rental property together with other family members. Right. Okay. They're, they're no longer obviously renting that home. Somebody else is, I assume? I'm sorry? Is somebody else uh, renting that home now, your, your rental property? That they're living in? Mm -hmm. No, they're they're, they're they're still there. Yes. Okay, it's still being rented to the McMichaels. Yes. Okay. And um, I, I gather then that uh, Lindsay McMichael, excuse me, Lee McMichaels, is making the monthly payments on that. Right now, no. Okay. Are you allowing them to stay in that home for free? Yes, I am. And how long have you allowed uh, the McMichaels, or I should say, Lee McMichaels, to remain in that home at no cost? Three months. to allow a renter to uh, stay in that home for three months without paying rent. Um, it goes without saying, you're, you're here in support of the McMichaels family. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. One final question. Ms. Scroggs, did Lee ask you to do that or did you offer to do that? I offered it. Thank you. I love you for this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Miss Hogue. Who? Bobby Ellis. I don't want to see that on a witness list. That was the second one. I realize you've been here since 10 in the morning, and I appreciate it. Will you state your full name and spell it for the court reporter? Bobby Ellis. Mr. Ellis, since the time you were six years old, where have you lived? Brunswick, Georgia. Go to school in Brunswick? Yes, ma'am. What do you do for a living? I own a boat dealership. What's it called? Ellis Marine. When did you start Ellis Marine? 1976. How old would you have been when you started that business? 25. And it 25 years old? And you've continued to run it. That's been your career since you've been 25. Yes, ma'am. Do you know Greg McMichael? Yes, ma'am. How do you know him, sir? 
Uh, met him through my brother. When they, uh, they both worked for the Glen County Police. Who is your brother? Rodney Ellis. He worked for the Glen County Police. Do you know about when? Would have been in the 80s. So was he working with Greg McMichael when Greg was in the Glen County Police too? I believe so. Do you know if that's how that did he inter did Rod introduce Craig to you? I believe so. And then did you all do some things together socially? Not, not that I remember. Did Greg ever become uh, work with you at Ellis Marine? He did. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I think he had left the police department. I don't know which one, uh, and. I don't remember exactly how it came to be, but he came and needed a job. I needed a salesperson, so I gave him the opportunity to come sell boats for me. How did he do at that job? Very good. And for that period of time between different law enforcement agencies, were you happy to have him work in there for you? Yes. Was he reliable? Absolutely. Dependable? Yes. Did he have access to the cash register? Absolutely. Did he take in money from customers? Yes, ma'am. And give you money to deposit at the end of the day? Yes, ma'am. Did you feel as if he worked hard to become knowledgeable about the business? Yes. You think he knows a lot about boats anyway? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was he also a customer of Ellis Marine? Yes, ma'am. And has he remained a customer since he's gone back uh, after that stint he did working for you? Yes, ma'am. So does he come in and hang around there sometimes in the past? Yeah. What kind of relationship would you say that you have? A business relationship, a cordial relationship? Both. Both? Mm. All right, and do you feel as if you know him well enough to give this court an opinion about whether you think if he were to be released on bond, he would pose <coughs> any danger to people or property if he were released? I don't believe he would. And do you have an opinion? Do you think you know him well enough to tell the court how you feel about whether if he were released on bond, he would come back to court for his trial. I believe he would. As a member of the Brunswick community since you've been six years old, is it important to you that the folks in this community don't infringe on the, the administration of justice, that they do what courts tell them to do? Absolutely. So would you come up here and support anyone if you thought they weren't gonna follow the rules of court? No. And what, what do you base your opinion on that he would return to court for this trial? What do you base that on about him? Just, just knowing what kind of person he is. Uh, he worked in law enforcement for a number of years. Uh, I think he's just a, a guy that would do what he says he'll do. Thank you. I have no more questions. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. to influence their testimony, 
to attempt to uh, obstruct the fair administration of justice. So Exhibit 23 is an affidavit of Diego Perez. Exhibit 24 is an affidavit of John Ronald Olson. And Exhibit 25 is an affidavit of Matthew Albenze. No objection. Next, Your Honor, while I had planned to have a virtual witness that the court allowed us to do, my virtual witness has backed out. And he's backed out for the very reason that you heard on the stand. My next witness was going to be Mario Morales. Uh, and he says that his family is just too frightened. So I'd like to make a proffer because I can tell you that I've interviewed him and can state in my place what he would have said. No, Your Honor, I would object to that. Proffers are permitted by the court. Uh, I understand that. I've got a bunch of questions about the testimony of the witness and why he's not present because we went through the process of allowing him to come. I got something from him. I think that's fine. No, I just, no, but that's the objection system. All right, and if, at a later date and time, if you'll allow me to make a proffer that I can put on the record. We can piece this together a little bit better. Uh, the court may consider. All right. Just say that. Okay. And my final witness, Your Honor, is Dr. George Powell. Trey Powell. Dr. Powell, clear this up for me. Is your name George Trey Powell, or it, is it? My name is George Edmund Powell, but I'm the third and have been known as Trey since day I one. See. I was just <laughs> clearing that up. I appreciate it. Dr. Powell, what do you do for a living? I'm a cardiologist. Where did you grow up? Valdosta. And when did you move to Brunswick? Uh, January of 2018. Give us a little bit of your medical background to your education and training to lead to your cardiology expertise. I uh, went to medical school at the Medical College of Georgia, uh, was on an Air Force scholarship, did my uh, residency and fellowship in the Air Force. Um, spent four years in the Air Force as a cardiologist paying back the scholarship time and then practiced in, uh, went back to my hometown in Valdosta uh, in private practice um, for 18 years before moving here two years ago. Are you a part of a medical practice here in Brunswick? Mm -hmm. I'm a part of coastal cardiology. So all in all, how long have you been <coughs> practicing cardiology? Cardiology for 26 years. And medicine? For 30, 30 and a half years in medicine. Very good. I want to now talk with you about Greg McMichael. Do you know him? I do. How do you know him? Uh, he's been a patient of mine for two years. Before that time, was he a patient in the practice group, but just not your patient? He was. So you took over his care from another doctor in the group? That's right. And when you took over his care, did you review the notes that were available to you and the records from the other doctor? Right. What, uh, if you would, can you tell us about Greg's medical history, medical situation, and then we'll kind of break it down a little bit. Uh, he has a history of coronary disease, um, underwent uh, uh, coronary angioplasty or stenting, 
I believe approximately 2006 had a, another episode um, that required another intervention in approximately 2009. Um, and let's talk about that. It was another intervention on the stint. Was there a problem with the stint? Right. Well, I, yeah, I don't know that I would <laughs> consider it a problem with the stint, but he had a, a blockage in one of his coronary arteries uh, that led to the coronary stint to open up that blockage in 2006. And then in 2009, uh, probably as a result of recurrent symptoms, I can't swear to that, but um, had another, um, uh, was found to have a blockage again within that same stent in 2009, and so that was opened up again with another stent. So those are the reasons he's coming to see a cardiologist. That's right. Any other extensive, any other medical treatment or medical history that you're aware of that impacts your work on him as a cardiologist? Uh, yeah, I think that, um, again, I assumed his care um, in roughly the summer of 2018, if I remember correctly, and then uh, approximately a year ago, he was hospitalized with a um, stroke, and if I remember correctly, I think he was hospitalized with an initial event, and shortly after that had a subsequent um, a neurologic event within a short period of time, weeks from the first to the second, uh, requiring hospitalization, and I was involved in that care as well, and that was a result of a blockage in one of the arteries going to the brain, which is the difference between a heart attack and a stroke. It's just the, the same mechanism, it's just a matter of which, you know, what organ the blood vessel that's blocked supplies. Um, and so I was involved in this care then, and that, again, it's atherosclerotic vascular disease, uh, just a difference in which artery is affected. And that stroke was in 2019, did you say? Yes, I think it was October and November of 2019. You're aware of, before you became his cardiologist, that he had sustained heart attacks in the past? Uh, he, I don't recall if he actually had a heart attack. He may well have had a heart attack back in the 06, 09 time frame that led to his coronary intervention. Um, my recollection is that his overall heart function was pretty well preserved. He didn't have severe damage from a prior heart attack and he had not had a heart attack to my recollection during the time that I had cared for him in the past couple of years. So in more of a lay term, he suffers from car coronary disease. That's exactly right. Would And there's all different levels of it. Is it fair to say his is fairly severe? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that would be a, a, a fair description. I mean, severe, severe coronary disease and mild coronary disease has a lot to do with whether it's you or somebody else that has it. <laughs> I think it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, you know, say somebody has a mild problem when they've got a blocked artery. But he, he uh, has not had, he's not sustained severe damage to his heart as a result of it. Okay. What all <laughs> have you been doing to treat him? Uh, primarily, my involvement has been, you know, managing him with medication to try and reduce the risk of the need for recurrent coronary interventions, recurrent blockage in the arteries of his heart, uh, or anywhere else, including the arteries of his brain as well. Um, and then, you know, most recently, I, in being involved in his care through the, the, uh, the neurologic events that he had last year, um, uh, trying to make sure that what we were doing to, to prevent further stroke in the future was adequate and that he didn't have some other cardiovascular problem like an arrhythmia that might um, predispose to stroke that would warrant treatment other than or differently than what we were treating him. Tell us what a loop implant is. So the, the um, I think what you're referring to is a little insertable cardiac monitor that continuously monitors the heart rhythm uh, that's inserted under the skin um, basically over the over top of the heart, but just in the subcutaneous tissue, just under the skin. 
uh, not into the chest, not on the heart, um, but it's a it's like a, a tiny little EKG monitor that monitors the heart rhythm continuously. And in his case, it, it can be used for lots of different reasons, but in his case, it's specifically uh, being used to monitor for a, uh, an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation that um, can predispose to stroke. And if found, would change the way he was being treated medically um, uh, to help reduce the risk of another stroke in the future. You implanted a loop implant in Greg McMichael? Yes. Do you recall about when? Uh, it, I, I don't remember the exact time, but it would have been around the time of his, uh, of his stroke presentation <laughs> last November. And it is a warning it can be a warning for an oncoming stroke because of an AFib event. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it's not necessarily a warning of an oncoming stroke. It it's, <coughs> it it monitors for an arrhythmia that, if present, um, necessitates a different type of treatment to reduce the risk of stroke in the future. The loop implant is one part of the system that you thought was necessary for Greg McMichael. The second part is the box that it's connected to. Is that right? Yeah, so this, the, the little monitor is what, um, you know, continually records the heart rhythm uh, and it stores data. It's like a tiny little computer chip that stores all the data uh, of what it's recording. In order to get that data to the physician, uh, it requires um, kind of like a modem that you would think of for your home computer and it'll talk wirelessly to the computer that's under his skin and then send that information over a cell signal to a monitoring station that allows us to see what's in the, the, uh, the loop recorder. So if you're in a jail cell and you have a loop implant but it is not connected by Wi-Fi to a box it is recording the data, but if there was an event, no one's going to know. Yeah, it would, it would have to be uh, uh, interrogated in some form or fashion um, directly. If he's not connected to, a, um, to this you know, bedside modem that can then send, a, send the information you know, over the, the cell signal and the internet, <coughs> then the information has to be directly pulled out of the uh, device with a special um, programmer that allows us to interrogate the device directly. And that, that would have to be done at the bedside. And it would be done after the fact. Well, all of this is after the fact. Well, meaning if there was an AFib event that the loop implant was trying to transmit by Wi-Fi to the box, but there was no Wi-Fi and no box, you're not going to know about that as his cardiologist unless or until you had the ability to come meet with Greg McMichael and interrogate the loop. That's correct. So if you would, will you tell us if there are any, uh, if, if Greg McMichael's <coughs> health situation requires intervention and monitoring by a cardiologist? like yourself. So are you asking me would he benefit from seeing a cardiologist on a periodic basis? Well that's what you order, isn't it? Yes. He come yes. to see you on a, a regular basis. That's right. So that you can keep up with the serious, potentially serious uh, situation that he has which is uh, coronary disease. Yes. And and that's no different than any patient that you have that uh, is right. seeing you after they've had uh, potential myocardial infarctions and stroke. That's right. And you would expect that if he did not continue to have the ability to see you, that he could be getting sicker and we wouldn't know. That's correct. Would you say the same of his need to continue to see a neurologist on a regular basis as a result of the stroke? Uh, yes, I think in general somebody who has had a neurologic event would benefit from surveillance with a neurologist and a cardiologist on a regular basis. And when you and I uh, discussed all of this, 
Would you share with the court if you see any increased risks to Greg's life, uh, health and life, if he were to remain incarcerated awaiting trial? Under the situation we just described where the loop implant is connected to nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think it would be, I think it would be very fair to say that if somebody is not able to see a physician and they have documented, well-established, long-standing atherosclerotic disease, uh, you know, with multiple previous coronary interventions and a couple strokes within the past year, um, that their risk of, of complications from that disease would be higher. Would you say that Greg McMichael, in the years you've been treating him, is a compliant patient? Does he show up? Do you have a memory of him? Oh, this guy never shows up. Yeah, no, I, I think, I, I don't recall that there was ever a situation where he was, you know, non-compliant with his, with his care. All right. It would have been good for him to lose some weight, though, right? It, it would be good for 99.9% .9 of my patients to All lose right. some weight. But there's a difference between a safe weight loss program if you suffer from coronary artery disease and a very quick, say, 45-pound weight loss in a matter of six months. Do you think that there's a difference between there's, those two? There's definitely a healthy way to lose weight and an unhealthy way to lose weight. I, I guess, absolutely. When you say that coronary artery disease, CAD, and angina is an unpredictable disease, how, what do you mean by that in terms of whether a patient is able to detect something coming on so that they can grab someone to come help them? Well, just atherosclerotic disease in general and, and atherosclerotic events, heart attacks, strokes, those kinds of events are very unpredictable in that they, they are they are triggered for reasons that we don't completely understand. and. Um, the the process you know happens suddenly the the plaque in the wall of the artery ruptures um, without any real usually without any real warning sign or identifiable trigger or predictable trigger and that's what causes the artery to completely occlude um, so yes it's a very unpredictable disease that that we know a lot about but there's a lot that we don't know about it and and for that reason you know we do recommend regular surveillance and medical therapy for risk factors and that kind of thing. And my last question that of course everyone would ask about now in COVID fortunately mm -hmm. Glen County seems that the jail seems safe. Uh, what are your numbers here in Glen County? Up? Down? Uh, they, they, we had had a pretty big re big <coughs> surge in the mid to late summer. The numbers have dramatically gone down since then. There's a little bit of an uptick here lately that hopefully is not the marker of things to come. But I think to sit here and tell you that I can tell you I can predict what's going to happen with COVID here or anywhere else would be, you know, would be a stretch. I, who knows what will happen? If Greg McMichael were to contract COVID, is he in the category of patients you would say who is at a higher risk of developing significant complications from it? Yes, he has several higher risk factors. Thank you. No more questions. Dr. Powell, Jesse Evans, with the state of Georgia, and prosecutor, just a few questions for you. I uh, understand that you have come on to the treatment of Mr. McMichaels, Greg McMichaels of late. You were not his initial uh, treating physician with your practice, correct? That's correct. By chance, does your um, practice treat inmates? Uh, yes. Okay. And um, w when you um, are treat inmates, I assume there's some coordination with the sheriff's office uh, in doing so. Is that correct? Right. Right. And, and for the stints themselves, educate me here. Are those... Those are uh, put in, in a hospital setting. They're not put in, in an office setting. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, have you treated inmates, for example, with stent issues at a local hospital um, when transported by the sheriff's office? Yes. Okay. 
and um, this coronary disease, a person can suffer from coronary disease whether you're in custody or out of custody, that's not determinative. We're, we're talking about a medical issue and not location of the patient, correct? That's right. You uh, have articulated, I think, very well that there's no severe damage that uh, Greg McMichael has suffered from as a result of his um, prior heart attacks or heart events, correct? No, no heart muscle damage, right? right. And um, it is certainly possible to medically manage a person who has um, the disease that Greg McMichael has, uh, even while in custody. That that's possible. To prescribe medications. Yes. yes. And you said, and you qualify this, if a person is not able to see a doctor, then the risk is higher. Um, you weren't asked to explore what medical care Greg McMichael is receiving with our sheriff's office uh, at the jail. That's, that was not your, your role in coming in today, correct? No, my, I'm not sure I understand what your question is. Sure. I just want to make sure that we're clear here. You're talking about your past treatment of Greg McMichael. Right. You don't, you don't know what his current standard no. or level of care is. No. It could very well be that he's seeing doctors at a, a facility here at, in Glen County at the jail. Yes, I'm not aware of, of his care. And, and this unpredictable event that a person can suffer from, that can unpredictably happen whether you're in custody or out of custody if you suffer from this disease. Is that accurate? That's right. Okay. Because it's unpredictable, wherever you may be, it, it can uh, happen. It happens to far more people who aren't in jail than who are in jail. Probably. probably. I mean, Numbers-wise. And um, perhaps that is because there's a constant 24/7 healthcare. Uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't mean the risk is lower in jail. I meant there are a lot more people out of jail than there are in jail. Right. <laughs> okay. So um, you are at least aware then through your work and your testimony that you've given here about treating inmates with the assistance of the sheriff's office that they are getting medical care in one way, shape, or form. You, you know that from your own personal experience, indeed, from your practice. Uh, I, I'm not aware of what the medical facility through the sheriff or medical the, the medical system through the sheriff's office is, is if that's what you're asking me. Right. Um, real quick, uh, I want to talk about mobility of uh, the defendant, Greg McMichael. Um, you can probably see him here on a monitor. The camera pans back and forth. You recognize Mr. McMichael, your patient. And obviously he's seated here, correct? That's right. Okay. Uh, he's able to stand. Uh, he was when I last saw him. Uh, he's able to walk. Yeah, when I, it's been six months or more since I last saw him. But yes, at that time. At, at least at your last dealings with uh, Mr. McMichael, he was uh, mobile. Yes. So his medical condition didn't impact him in that way, correct? Uh, yeah, not to my knowledge. Thanks. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. That's all, Judge. No more questions. May the witness be released? Yes, thank you. Let me step down. <laughs> Submitted to both sides, the evidence, uh, uh, witness list, those kinds of things. So, um, 
you know, whatever his testimony is, we don't know that. I don't have a document that says what he would say. I haven't been provided an affidavit such, such as those. All I have is a, a name on a piece of paper. I don't know what, what that weight that carries in terms of the bond considerations. I don't have an affidavit on that. I don't have an officer on this side of the hearing, which is also a concern. We never have the rule. I'll take the profit, of course, not considering it at this point. Uh, I'll take the profit. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Was the proffer to why he's not appearing, or the proffer is what his testimony was? What he was prepared to testify to. He is a former co-worker? Yes, sir. No affidavit? No, I was prepared, and he was prepared to testify virtually. He's just recovered from a serious colon operation. I haven't been given his contact information, just the name. It would be no different than if he had testified virtually. Well, but he's still here. It's no different than if he found him here in court. He was given an opportunity to appear virtually, so he would, of course, not take the property. I'm sorry? Upon reconsideration, of course, not to take the property, he would appear. All right. I will make the record clear on that, and I give you my objection. Thank you. And with that, Your Honor, we rest. I believe all of my exhibits are in. Thank you. Your Honor, in rebuttal, I am going to tender a number of exhibits that have already been provided to the court by phone drive. And what I'm going to do is, because they're so voluminous, I'm screen sharing now. I trust the court can see that. Why did that work here and not the other? So I asked Cedric, the young man who's working the technology, there was an extra click that needed to be accomplished. I can show you if you'd like to see it. I just want to make sure that we're clear on what's going on. I can see, just so that we're clear on the record, I did have a paper copy of all of the documents that have been submitted on behalf of Franklin Myers. I could see what was being put up on the board so that I knew what was being referenced. So I did have an opportunity to look through those as they were presented. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what was being presented. When you do the screen share for everyone's benefit, do you see that box that I clicked? You have to click that first in order to share the screen. I'm happy to show you during the break. The little box with the arrow going on? Yes. Yes. I thought he did that. He told me and then I thought he did it. Okay. I think I understand what happened. I just want to make sure. Judge, the flash drive that I'm going to tender has a number of exhibits on it. I'm going to pull this up just so you can see the contents of the flash drive. This is actually taken from the flash drive itself. Is that any different than what I was sent? Other than changing maybe the labels, there was an objection as to specifically identifying what substantively may have been on there. So for some of them, for example, in States Exhibit 8, some of them now read 8A, 8B, 8C, if that makes sense. But other than that, no, substantively it is the same just with the label changes. So what I would like to do with the court's permission is go through and identify specifically what each of these items are. I don't think at this point I need to display them. I'll do that at the appropriate time so that I can articulate for the court what precisely is included on this thumb drive. In addition to that, I have two notebooks that I'm going to provide to the court that's got the 
documentary evidence that's included on this thumb drive as well. So, for example, State's Exhibit Number 1 is Travis McMichael's arrest warrants. In this notebook under Tab 1, you'll see a physical copy of those arrest warrants. So is it State's intent then to tender those notebooks? Make those part of the record as well, yes. I want there to be both documentary evidence as well as this thumb drive also, as you know, contains video and audio clips as well. So I want everything to be part of the record. My under... Yes. At the point in time when Mr. Evans actually tenders the flash drive containing the exhibits, we would ask to go one by one so we can enforce our objections if we have them. My, I guess, issue with that is that I thought that that's what we did this morning. The court's notice required that if there was going to be objections to the evidence that we were going to handle that pre-hearing is my understanding. In fact, that's what I think we did at 10 o'clock. No, Your Honor. The order is for authenticity. As long as I don't have an authenticity, that should be addressed. As far as admissibility, other things that have already been addressed have already been addressed. So when I get back into arguments, think about it. So if it's okay with the court, I'll simply go through the list as a whole right now of what the 21 folders that are included on here, unless you're asking me to stop asking each one to hear from the defense per exhibit. We would ask to go one by one so we can voice our objections and the court can rule on its admissibility. States 1 is Travis McMichael's arrest warrant. We would object. As to relevance and its relevance to the IALA factors, the bond factors the court is to consider. He's been indicted. What in the world does an arrest warrant have to do with any of the factors the court is to consider? Your Honor, I'll position myself here during this presentation because I'll be joining in several of these same objections. Yes, we object as well to States 1 on relevance. I'll remind the court, as I did this morning, that under OCGA 24-1-2-C6, the rules of evidence shall not apply in proceedings with respect to release on bail and bond. So just as a threshold matter, I will mention that. Arguably, I would think that relevance, though, is something that the court should consider in terms of the admissibility. The arrest warrant for Travis McMichael shows that he was charged with one thing and he is now charged with something significantly more serious. So in terms of risk of flight and in terms of the potential punishment that is of concern to the state, that's the relevant purpose for tendering States 1. I signed 1 and 2. You did, I believe, yes. So that makes sense as to why 3 may be relevant, but because 3 is more serious than 1 and 2. Again, what in the world is the relevance of 1 and 2? Who cares that the charges change as long as we know what the charges are now that the court has in front of them? I understand the position as far as relevance of 1 and 2. States 2 would be Greg McMichael's arrest warrants. States 3 is the indictment. Hearing no objection, I'll move on to States 4. That is the preliminary hearing transcript that I think we addressed this morning. We renew our objection. As the court knows, and I don't want to be a dead horse, but the state has laid out assertions of fact and legal conclusions, or not legal conclusions, that it wants the court to draw from the preliminary hearing transcript. I believe I addressed that this morning and indicated that the court understands the difference between facts and argument. And I think we addressed the 19 bullet points. I saw them. I understand that those bullet points are the state's interpretation of facts. As far as the preliminary hearing transcript, the court has found that it did not exclude this part of the evidence in this case. Pardon me? It did not exclude it as evidence in the bond in this case. Yeah, if I may, on behalf of Greg McMichael, to refine the discussion here and the objection, the preliminary hearing, of course, covered a great deal of ground. And when the state did helpfully give us the 19 bullet points yesterday, that was Thursday, Tuesday morning, in their response to our objection, now the concern is, okay, is it the 19 alleged facts in the response motion 
that they've taken from the 274 page preliminary hearing transcript that are in evidence here today? Or is it the entire thing? Which, who knows, it could have a couple hundred discrete facts in it. We have to be able to respond, and we plan to respond here today, at least to the 19 alleged facts in our rebuttal case when the state's, when the state rests here. How's everybody going to do? We're welcome to come, I mean, we're free to come back tomorrow. We have not. Then we'll have to stay as long as the court will have us. Or we can continue the hearing, because we do have a right to rebut the facts that are in the record. We can continue the hearing, because we do have a right to rebut these alleged facts. Right now, we think there's 19 of them. But what's being offered here is a 274 page transcript. So which is it? Which is it that's going to be here before this court being considered on how we move this forward? There are digestible facts within the preliminary hearing transcripts. Everybody who's here, everybody knows what happened. Those issues that you believe you need to address, this is an opportunity, or in a way, it was an opportunity in some ways. It was an opportunity to go ahead and flesh that out. So I think the court's already ruled. State's exhibit number five is the state's aggravation notices that we submitted on the defense, informing them of the possibility of life without the possibility of parole if convicted. Publicly filed documents here. State's exhibit six, hearing no objection, unless the court wants me to pause, is the DOJ press release that I know the court saw as part of the other bond hearing for Mr. Bryant. State's exhibit number seven is a business record certification for a Southern Poverty Law Group's report involving a particular group. Your Honor, that dovetails with the exhibit after that, which is state's exhibit 10. I think that's hard for me to see. It dovetails with the attempt to introduce Greg McMichael's social media, number nine, which we discussed earlier. The SPLC article is a lengthy, interesting article about a hate crime organization based on that word somewhere in a post, somewhere on Greg McMichael's Facebook page about two years ago. I'll have to look back, a year ago. So right now, you're going to have in front of you an interesting article on a hate group, some Facebook posts that Greg McMichael may have never have seen or never have seen, and I object to both of those. Seven is directly related, she is correct, Ms. Hogue is, to state's exhibit number eight. So state's exhibit seven is a business record of an article based on an investigative report that was performed by the Southern Poverty Law Center involving a particular group. It's pertinent because of state's exhibit number eight, some social media that was posted by defendant Greg McMichael. I'm sorry, number nine, I said the wrong number. I went through this before, there were a number of business record certifications, that's a certified business record certification. The top page is, yes sir. State's exhibit number eight is Travis McMichael's social media, and then there's some subparts in that as well. I think it's A through L inside the folder. There are objections to the subparts of state law, so there are two of those ones, it's admitting for all of them, you just go through them by one. Well, I'm tendering them all. So, A, A. Which is the bottom up. Yes. No objection. Well, let me tell you something. This is a Facebook post dated July of 2019, some six months prior to the February 23rd incident. It doesn't 
show future dangerousness because there's nothing happening in July, August, September, October, November, December, January. It doesn't predict dangerous because nothing's happening in March, April, or May until they're arrested. It doesn't show anything except the neighborhood is under attack in its view by people coming in and committing property crimes. And Travis is telling the neighbors to protect themselves. So it doesn't play into the factors the court has to consider as to future dangerousness or risk of committing felonies if released on bail. So I object as to In this Facebook group post for Satilla Shores, the defendant posts essentially arm up in response to things that allegedly are occurring in this neighborhood. It certainly goes to dangerousness to the property community, to other people. Um, so we believe it's pertinent for that. 8B is a similar post from the Satilla Shores Facebook page, the fire post. persons as well as risk of committing a new felony um, or new crime and here you have a post where a defendant is affirmatively saying that they're playing with fire that he's that this could lead precisely to what we're talking about danger to community persons or property they are the ones being attacked it's not Travis McMichael saying I'm going into neighborhoods looking for people who are committing crimes it's saying they come to our neighborhood and commit crimes we need to A, protect ourselves, and B, if they come and endanger our lives, we have a right to protect ourselves. It's not a threat. Judge, if I could state an objection. Um, 8C and 8D uh, involve a violent video called Coon on a Highway. Your Honor, with regard, let's say that number again. 8C and 8D. Regard to 8C, it is a post by Mr. Long, James Kirk Long. I don't think that there's evidence that Travis McMichael uh, liked it, reposted it. Absolutely. I think it was the court's prior ruling on it, but we think it was understandable. Yeah, but these are labeled because you indicate differently than what I have. I believe. The actual posting itself in the one of them Correct. Eight E, F, G, and H. Uh, and you're correct, just to be clear, Judge, on why the labels have changed. You may recall that in one of the defendants' filings they were complaining about the labels. They wanted those changes to not reflect the, the title of what it had been. So 8E, I will just refer to this in, in total, E through H, we're dealing with Johnny Rebel videos. And the Johnny Rebel video, the text portion of it, E and F, are the uh, text portion from Facebook that shows who posted what or who shared what. 8G and H are the actual videos themselves. The chronology is that somebody sent this to Travis McMichael, that's documented in the documentary evidence. He turned around, laughed at it, and then sent it out to another person, which is why there's two videos and two document trails. And it's my understanding that this occurred in June of 2019, some seven months prior to the time Mr. Arbery came into Satilla Shores uh, and entered the house. So we would object as to relevance. <coughs> Okay. 
eight I is a post involving never pointing a gun unless you intend to use it. manner in which it's used, Your Honor, and dangerousness to person, property, the community, those types of things. Now you have to scroll down. It's actually below that for the second one. Because they're in a string, Your Honor, it's actually the one uh, below it. False a child raising his hand. So I just trust that what the court will do is not considered. Uh, H.J. involves a posting about dispatching a threat. This is a post dated 7-24-2019 in which one of the neighbors are complaining about aggressive dogs. And Travis responds basically that you need to protect yourself from aggressive dogs shoot them if you have to, same with humans, aggressive humans. Um, Travis commenting on the ability of one to defend themselves, again, I don't think it shows anything as to future dangerousness. It's a post from the defendant talking about using a firearm to kill another human being if he deems it to be a threat. Isn't that, that is, seems to be the law. I'm withdrawing HK and I would I'm sorry, 8K and uh, there's no need to go into 8L either we'll withdraw those two those are business records affidavits, so they're just certifications for all of the posts we on to stakes 9? messages and posts that we deal with here involve uh, racial groups, including some of the hate groups that we've talked about, Your Honor. They also involved uh, posts and things about, I would call it vigilanteism. Your Honor, I challenge respectfully Mr. Evans to say, show us anything in this picture. You can open it up, Jesse. Anything that has anything Which to do with Which one are you referring race? to? Dear Government, page 373. It's a uh, they're not numbered. Mm -hmm. Now 
9A identity Dixie. All right, we can do that one. We'll go back to that. <coughs> I object to that, Your Honor. Again, there's no indication that it reflects any attitudes or opinions of the client, and even if it did, these are not hateful thoughts. These are thoughts we might differ with. Identity Dixie, what you see at the bottom, Your Honor, is a meme that a confederate would say, stop letting strangers lecture you on your ancestors. And at the bottom, it's posted or created by something called identitydixie.com. Did you open that back up, Jesse? That, Your Honor, that little thing at the bottom, identitydixie.com, underneath a statement that somebody seems to support, is the link to this hate group. It's the only thing they have that links Greg McMichael to a hate group that a Southern Poverty Law Center writes a very persuasive argument about the 20 pages that they've provided to you. On April 17, 2019, Defendant Greg McMichael changed his status update to include Identity Dixie, which is the subject of the prior uh, exhibit that the court has already ruled admissible from the SPLC. And then here is the uh, link to that. Uh, 8C, you've already ruled in it. It was actually the article itself. The other one has a business record certification. 8B, excuse me, 9B, make a record. We're on 9, 9A, 9B, and 9C. Apologize, court reporter. So 9C is the article of which you've already uh, admitted with the business record certification. So I think we're done with 9. And may At I least clarify a, B, and C. that? Do we agree? So the court's aware before you, if you were to venture to read that article, that the connection I drew is the only connection between Greg McMichael, the website at the bottom of that post, and Identity Dixie. Judge, one of the factors this court is going to be called upon to consider, to consider is, is risk of flight. And you're already aware and have already admitted the Department of Justice noticed that they're investigating things. I think that this is particularly um, pertinent inf information when the state gets to that point in the discussion. I couldn't disagree more, Your Honor, and here's the reason. Hate groups are proud of being hated, about proud of being haters. They're out there, that's the whole point. You don't have to dig six months back to find a otherwise innocuous post that might express something in a way you're not happy with in order to say, hey, because there's a website at the bottom that's now linked to a hate group, that's not a hate crime. It's not a member of a hate group. He's not waving a flag. He's not endorsing this. He liked the, if, if he put it on there, and again, that's a question of weight right now, then maybe he liked that sentiment as an individual who has lived in Brunswick, Georgia, and his generations go back and back, and he's looking at genealogy. I mean, the idea that you could listen to what all we put up this morning and this afternoon, and this should somehow lend itself to an exception to the presumption for bond. That's why I stand by it, because this is all getting a little dangerous. Well, I don't disagree. We're going down a, um, a path that this court uh, would prefer not to go down. Um, but it appears to be where this case is headed. Mm -hmm. Um, there are uh, insurance conditions on both sides. Uh, we're bond here, again, my rulings here are uh, with regard to the standards associated with bond here, so I'm not sure what this ends up doing in the trial. Um, I'm working through the bond issues. Um, I was had hours to put up witnesses and all sorts of evidence about reputation and opinions about how the uh, defendants um, fit into the aisle um, standard, and it's the state's opportunity to do the same. So we're all 9D and 9E, we're talking about a video. It's the same song that I referred to in um, State's Exhibit A involving Travis McMichaels, Johnny Rebels, the, the name of 
of the song, but it's associated with a different video. So this is from, again, nine would be Greg McMichael's social media. I renew my Nine F, G, and H. This is the text data for something called shouting from the rooftops. G is the actual post itself involving. So this is, a, again, a post on Greg Michael's Facebook page, a status update he posted, where it um, talks about neo-Confederate views. And in particular, a paragraph at the end involving Woodstock and what might have happened if it was attended by blacks versus whites. I object, Your Honor. Position Nine H is a status update by Defendant Greg Michaels about vigilantism and use of violence. By Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Cooper, who I guess is not being investigated by the government for this hate speech. I didn't say that was hate speech. I said it was a post that certainly lends itself to vigilantism and violence. I object. And then finally, uh, I talks about uh, use of guns to fight crime. So again, it's a more of a, I would call it your own a vigilantism type post. Objection. This is just the affidavit, business records affidavit, your honor, for Facebook. States 10 is Travis McMichael's messaging <coughs> involving racist terms. Now, this is a message dated March now, going even further back, almost a year prior to the shooting incident. Uh, I would object as to relevance, as to bond factors, or has to consider for Travis McMichael. He uses racist terms here, um, <coughs> talking about risk of flight and risk of committing new crimes in the Department of Justice notice that the court's already admitted. And um, by the way, for our record, 10A and 10B are just different formats of that same conversation. And I'm sorry if it's lost on me, but how does, as, as, as disgusting as it may be, how does using the N-word present risk of flight, even if Justice Department mm -hmm. is investigating the case they don't bring cases based on people using the N-word. They have to prove a causal link between the shooting or death or injury and the risk. That, that someone shoots or shoots and kills someone because of race. Not because of thought, but because of actual race. Judge, for our purposes for this bond hearing, you must consider whether there's risk that these defendants are committing crimes or are a risk of flight based on the totality of what this court knows, the fact that we have uncovered deeply disturbing race and racial uh, texts and messages certainly goes to not only the possibility but a real probability of what might happen in a concurrent investigation and that causes the state concern about risk of flight and risk of committing new crimes. It's so interesting because I think today the uh, Justice Department is bringing before the grand jury Travis McMichael's friend, who's black. Yes. No idea what came out of it. No idea what you're referring to. The Justice Department has a grand jury investigation. Investigation, as Mr. Evans has noted time and time again, there's a hate crime investigation by DOJ. Uh, that's, that's completely out of left field right now. I, I have no idea what was being referred to here. Um, but I'm, what I'm telling the court is. Mr. Evans has repeatedly said that because there's a hate crime investigation, these clients, these defendants, the McMichaels, are at risk of flight. 
And he's using, actually, this exhibit, which is, I think, 10, uh, that, uh, in which Travis McMichael uses the n as proof that this hate crime investigation is going to result in an indictment. And therefore, Judge, they're looking at serious uh, uh, potential penalties in federal court, and therefore, there are risk of flight. That's his argument. Otherwise, why is the hate crime investigation even relevant? It's just an investigation. It's a complaint. So, I mean, I've got to just deal with IL factors, which is more than just risk of flight. I've got four IL factors. So, a lot of other things the court has to consider as part of those four factors. The position the court's simply taking at this point is that the defense got up and presented a whole slew of opinion testimony and evidence with regard to the reputation of these individuals within the community. Yeah. It's not the state's opportunity to get up and present whatever evidence is that or they have. The court's position, there was no overruling this, is for the purposes of bond hearing. This information helps the court understand not only the testimony of the prior witnesses, but also the evidence that the state is now going to try to formulate with regard to the IL factors. So it's being overruled. Again, we're in a bond hearing. And I want to be very clear about this. What's in here? I would imagine to many, uh, would be trouble. Okay? I get it. And this is a road that I really don't want to go down. But in this particular case, it's an issue that's going to keep coming up. Because if we start getting into self-defense and other matters, state and defense, then the court, the court's going to have to keep figuring this out. This evidence at this point, though, is only coming in for the person bond here. It's already on the people. Okay? Proceed. States 10 are Travis McMichael, um, excuse me, we just dealt with 10. States 11 are uh, recorded jail calls by Travis McMichael. Objection to violence. What's, what's well, there's, the a, there's a bunch of them. Uh, I, I don't get to do it. There's probably 10. I'm going to talk about one particular call where Travis McMichael uh, asked, talks to his mom about having his sister take down her social media, which was the source of discussion with Lee McMichael when she was on the stand. And we would object to the other ones as being irrelevant, or else not, not tender. Not tender. I'm not going to play the other ones. I'll just state for the court that I'm, I'll stay away from them. We're sticking to the one. And is, is there a, um, a date, uh, Mr. Evans? Yes. For that particular one or a number? Yes. States 13, 12. I'm sorry, 12 is going to be recorded phone calls by Greg McMichael. There are several of those that I, I'm going to play at least snippets of, and they involve the cross examination of Lee McMichael about getting rid of evidence the state would assert. You know, there are 10 jail phone calls in that folder, and Best I can count quickly, four of the ten are phone calls with Lee McMichael. So if the state's position is the other six are out, then uh, we'll deal with the four, or whichever one of the four that are with Lee McMichael the state just referred to, but then the others would be irrelevant and should not be admitted into evidence. Unless I misrepresented what I just heard the state's no, I'm going to go into uh, several calls, and I'm pulling up the dates on those right now. Five, 
So the other seven should not be admitted into evidence if they're not relevant to anything the state's presenting. I'm not going to play this. Salt. <clears throat> States 13 involves an investigation about uh, coded letters and jail correspondence. Our States 13 likewise has one, two, three, four, <coughs> five, six files within it. Um, Two of them are copies of a postcard that are at issue and I would say are relevant. However, I do object to the FBI interviews of two jailers and the recording of one of those interviews and a transcript of one of those interviews. Uh, maybe three different jailers, Stacy Futch, Stephanie Britt, and Jennifer Legg, I presume are all jailers at Clinton County. <coughs> so two, two files within there, a faded and a traced over postcard. I think there is relevance to that. And I don't really know how space can argue it, but all these interviews about it with people that we don't get to cross-examine, we can even present one of our own bond witnesses by proper now I've got to deal with FBI interviews of jailers. Just as they presented letters and affidavits, we are presenting um, documented reports of an investigation into two things. One, a coded letter that sounds like they're not objecting to that was sent out by Greg McMichael and recovered as part of the Glenn County Sheriff's Office investigation. The other one involves an investigation about the a situation called boomerangs where uh, inmates attempt to contact other inmates by getting mail out that comes back with a return address to the inmate that they want. So these reports document that investigation. They are. And I'll remind the court that this is a bond hearing and it goes to influencing and obstruction. The only reason to say your consistency uh, and fundamental fairness is if these witnesses were available and aren't coming in and explaining what all that is, um, the uh, folks can come in and uh, as postcards or letters or whatever they are to do. That brings us to <coughs> State's 14 Glenn County Sheriff's Office Inmate Handbook, which involves this mail that we're talking about. Yeah, and our objection to that is also relevance because for the handbook to be relevant, the handbook says you can't send postcards that are written in code. <coughs> and then to argue, well, that's Greg McMichael's attempt to obstruct the administration of justice by breaking the jail rules. They'd have to prove that he read that handbook, had received that handbook, viewed it and then intentionally violated it to obstruct the administration of the justice at the jail. All that is is the handbook itself. I didn't see anything in that folder that says who gave it to Greg McMichael, if he signed for it, if he read it. And if, matter of fact, I know it's not printed and given to him. It's, it's in digital form and wasn't viewed by him. But there's no evidence that he ever saw it and read it and then purposely violated it. I know from the reports that Glenn County Sheriff's Office approached him and told him that he was in violation of these rules. This book simply documents what those rules are at the jail. Well, no, they came to him with the coded letter and, said, and gave it back to him and said, you can't send this out. He said, why not? Because it's not in the, the rule book says you can't. Well, that, that's, you know, the rule book is not relevant if he never saw it. It's kind of like the social media argument. You can't just put it in and say, here are the rules you broke, but you didn't know the rules before you well, broke them. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, whatever these postcards are, 
they're just being tendered in. The state's position is, I assume, that it's some sort of code. So if the handbook is only coming to say, hey, there's some rules out there, the investigative reports aren't coming in, so there's no opinions or investigation. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, at this point, based on the courts letting in, the handbook's just there to say, here's generally what the rules are bidding. Yes. Okay. But if the, if the argument based on that is Greg McMichael intentionally obstructed justice by breaking the jail rule, I'm not, I'm not going, I mean, that's well beyond what the court would ever consider it for with regard to bond. Well, then why is any of that coming in? I'm not sure. Well, because the state's claiming that there were some coded letters from the jail. Uh, it'd be helpful to the court to know what generally the position of law enforcement would be with regard to coded letters without implying that there has been, um, that he had knowledge, um, and without uh, addressing the ongoing investigation. So if there's a rule, I'd like to put a rule. Or, or if I suppose the court would like to hear and won't hear that it was in fact a coded letter rather than gibberish. There, there won't be any evidence of that, but I'll be able to add in the rebuttal on it. I object to the jail handbook and I've been open to just understand it if you want. State's Exhibit 15 is the cell phone video that Mr. Bryan took of the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery. You know, it, it may be self-evident, but I'm missing it. They're on trial for murder, for a shooting that occurred on February 23rd. So I fail to see the relevance of basically saying to the court, they're on trial for murder, Judge. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to repeat that over and over again between now and the state's trial. Mm -hmm. And I'll look at both sides. Uh, but let's turn it through the evidence since we apparently need to. The cell phone video. We object. That's your relevance. Well, I, I join in that objection to Greg McFarland. Uh, it, it's being offered with, with, without context. Which actually gets me to 16. 16 is frame by frame. Um, we have that uh, uh, slowed down and, and turned frame by frame photos of State's Exhibit number 15. So it's, it's, to, it's the same except it's not in video format. It's still shots, some of which I'm going to refer to. Apparently, if I'm understanding, he's going to show clips through still pictures, essentially arguing that the strength of the state's case, which we're prepared to rebut. It's not about strength of the state's case. It's about the four Iola factors, danger to person, property, and the community, uh, among other things, risk of committing a crime. Really, I, I want to stay as much focused as much as possible, Your Honor, to those four factors and how all of this evidence relates to that. It's assuming it's a crime. That's it. In terms of the videos, you uh, can argue that's the first familiar with the evidence. This, this is yeah. it's just a different question. Yeah. 17 are cell phone records for Greg McMichael. No objection. State's Exhibit 18 is a voicemail Greg McMichael left for then District Attorney Jackie Johnson. No objection. 519 are some photos. 19 photos. Sure. During the shooting, some stray pellets actually struck a house in the neighborhood, so it could have hurt a person. It definitely damaged property. Um, could have hurt somebody in the community. It goes to that prong. So as part of the shooting, I wanted to show the court some additional damage um, above and beyond what was inflicted on Ahmaud Arbery. There's like four or five of the house. Do you want to see them? No, no, no. I, the, there's, I have a folder, several folders, including a photograph, I think, of Craig and, and a photograph of Black or something. That's the last one right here. But I'm not to that one yet. Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, one photograph of the scene where Ahmaud Arbery was shot. Yeah, I'm 
danger to person, property, in the community to show precisely where he was shot in this community in relation to the house that was shot up and those types of things, Judge? Jack. That's what we're here. That's what we're going to trial for. How does, you know, what was going on? Last but not least, this is the photograph they referred to of Greg McMichael with um, DA, then DA, the District Attorney for the Brunswick Judicial Circuit. It was recovered from Travis McMichael's cell phone. It becomes pertinent because of a phone call that the defendant, Greg McMichael, placed from the crime scene uh, to um, Jackie Johnson which is the source of the voicemail that the court already admitted without objection. It's voicemail then, and it's actually work for It's what? It's work for and yes. the voicemail's in. Yes, it is. So what's the photo? It shows his relationship, Your Honor, to him and how he's attempting to obstruct the investigation and to um, influence how the investigation was being handled literally from the crime scene by placing a phone call to the DA who he no longer worked for. But isn't that, isn't that the voicemail? It is the voicemail, yes. I object to the picture for the same reason you're as perplexed. I, I, the I fact that his boss, his, he has a picture of his boss in his phone on Travis's phone. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. States 20 are post records. Objection. Is that what they're attempting to show is uh, some attempt to connect this to the IALA factors we got out in evidence that Greg had two instances where he was deficient in his training hours and got waivers where you pay a fine and show your other hours that you can count towards the ones you missed. And then at the end, he went ahead and took a suspension of his post so that he could just finish out until his retirement with Jackie Johnson's office. I don't see what factor that goes to any more than if I miss my CLE this year, I'm likely to flee. pertinent in several ways, and not the least of which is that numerous witnesses have been called by the defense today to argue about and to assert for the court that he was uh, some great law enforcement officer when in fact records revealed that he uh, lacked post certification from uh, I think it was 2006 to 2014 and there was disciplinary action against him not once but it appears twice. Um, so well, that part It's that there were lapses, the, the certification was not required from the DA's office. Uh, but there was testimony about his record as a post certified officer. And I don't know that that has been established that you don't have to be a post certified uh, police officer to be an, an, an investigator um, from, from the witness stand. I want to be clear on that. I know the question was posed. Um, is it possible that you can be an investigator and not have post powers? But I don't think that the witness was capable of giving the answer to that. Testimony about that? No, but I have testimony that his post certification lapsed and he was not allowed to be an investigator anymore. In fact, they moved him uh, their internal document where he admitted that he was, did not have those post arrest certifications, so he had to be reclassified. That's right. That's what the sheriff and uh, the district attorney, his boss, agreed to do because he did not. You've got the sheriff right here to. I have no doubt he will tell you, don't require post-certification to be an investigator in the district attorney's office. He, when you said he was disciplined, that just is not accurate. He had a waiver. He applied for a waiver to post. Uh, I have Jeff Miller, the director of certification for post, who's emailing me saying, <laughs> he's, um, is this, uh, am I ever going to get called? He's a virtual witness in Atlanta to say, this is what happens. If you miss an hour of a necessary course, but you've got so many other hours, then the next year you get a waiver, you get to pay a fine, and you apply, and they did it twice, both because of medical situations. And at the end, he just said, I don't need this anymore. I'll just not be post-certified, and I will finish out my investigative career at the DA's office before I retire. I just can't see what this this could go to. Well, the testimony could have come from last time. The post records, 
for business records. Last, we have um, certain body cam footage that we're going to place some clips of. That states 21. In particular, I think there's two or three clips that we have of Greg McMichael and his initial interactions with law enforcement. He uh, immediately throws out that he's former Glen County uh, police, that he's a former Glen County chief investigator, and the state would assert is using his former position to try, try to influence the investigation. Your Honor, we don't have any objection to <clears throat> the admissibility of those body cams, but I will say this. <clears throat> There's probably an um, hour and a half to two hours worth of video on them, and to go in and cherry pick them and then make an argument that would be utterly bereft of proper context, as you just heard, <laughs> to say he's trying to influence. <coughs> I will want to go into more of those videos to show what the context makes those comments mean. As we all know, content, context determines meaning. And if he's going to go in and play, I don't know, two or three seconds of Michael mentioning to a police officer, I used to be a police officer, and then argue to the court from that that he's trying to obstruct the administration of justice, you're going to have to see the whole video because that's not what he's doing. And it's a matter of interpretation. I understand the state's got their interpretation, and we have ours, and the court's got to make the call. But you can't make it on just the few little clips you're going to get, in I presume, in closing argument. The state's plan is just to present all this stuff, rest, and then I guess we're going to have about an hour or two closing argument where stuff's going to get shown and played. Well, no, we'll have rebuttal. Well, yeah, before we even get to that, we go through all of this stuff and give our rebuttal evidence, which we have plenty to prepare and present, including on these body cams. I'm saying there's no objection. Last round, and just to be clear, I'm watching the body cam and know that it might be an hour and a half, but probably 10 minutes of stuff actually happening in my body cam, so I'd be interested to see what contents we're talking about. Um, so, uh, I understand the position. With that, Your Honor, I'm going to deliver to the clerk the actual flash drive that we've gone through, a copy of that's been preloaded onto this Mondo pad and then two notebooks that include the written documentation that's been printed and is in a print form. Thank you. I have victim impact testimony, Your Honor. And then I believe that's all of the evidence the state has. Marcus Arbery, he was president at a prior hearing, and uh, Marcus has asked that I read a short statement to you. It's very similar, in fact, it comes from the same statement that was presented to you by the state last time. So, per Mr. Arbery's statement, you can have a seat, Mr. Mr. Arbery. He is the father of Ahmaud Arbery. Quote, I suffered the deepest loss a father can endure when the McMichaels, with the knowing participation of William Roddy Bryan Jr., acted as my son's judge, jury, and executioner. I urge the court to reject the motion for bond and continue to keep defendants behind bars. Thank you, sir. Next, we have the victim impact statement of Maude Arbery's mother. Last time, Your Honor, this victim impact statement was presented to the court in the podium. Are you okay with doing that? Again? That's fine. <coughs> If you will, I'm going to give you an oath of law unless you have to clerk to do that. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is what we got? You can put your hand down. Uh, first, uh, reintroduce yourself to the court. We need to make a record here. So say your first and last name and spell it for our court reporter. 
My name is Wanda Cooper Jones. Spell my last name. So, first name, last name. Um, first name is Wanda. That's W A N D A. Cooper is C O O P E R. Jones, J O N E S. And you prepared a, a short written statement, a victim impact statement that you wish to share, share with the court about your son and about this volunteering today. Is that correct? That is correct. Go ahead. Now. Someone contacted my attorney on the behalf of Lynn County this past spring during the course of the GBI's secondary investigation. They discovered what they believe to be one of Amaz's bone fragments near where he was murdered in Satilla Shores. They wanted to know what we wanted to do with those pieces of my son that they were still discovering in the streets. I have sat here and I've listened to the attorneys for both Travis and Gregory McMichael. They tried to explain that their, that their clients believe that my son was a trespasser. On that bright Sunday afternoon, as he ran down the streets, he was somehow engaged in a criminal enterprise. Their defense is summed up in an idea of grabbing their guns, chasing, boxing my son in with the vehicles, pursuing him, and eventually shooting him to death, ripping his body into pieces. And that was the right thing to do. That if given the opportunity, both men would do the same thing again. These men are proud of what they've done. And they want to go home because in their selfish minds, they think that they're the good guys. And I and my family is left literally to pick up the pieces. As the court may imagine, I have suffered. I continue to suffer mentally and emotionally while I wait for justice for my son. My daughter, Jasmine's older sister, um, Jasmine Amon's older sister, his best friend, just had her first baby. I often think as she begins the journey of motherhood, will I have the words of wisdom to help her along the way? Mothers protect their children. I wasn't given the opportunity to protect my son. I'm here to ask this court to help me be a mother who protects my grandchildren and fight for justice for my son. He ran this path many times. And our home was just a light jog away. But for him, no matter how he maneuvered, no matter how, he, how fast he ran, no matter how fast he ran, or how quickly he turned, these men refused to let him go home. They should not go home now to prepare for their defense, to enjoy their children and grandchildren, and to be embraced by the community. These men are as dangerous today as they were on February the 23rd of 2020. It is not fair for these guys to even get a pretrial release even for consideration. They cannot go home. In the name of justice, decency, and fairness, please keep these men behind bars until they can answer for what they did. And I also want to ask the courts, Amal wasn't allowed to go home. Amal wasn't even allowed the, the chance to live. He was denied all of that. Thank you. Where's the stick presentation? Done. All right. Good. Because I think this is an appropriate place to end it now. Uh, it's
it's 530. Um, we all need to consider where we are and um, find a date certain in the very future to finish this. Thank you. 